Demon is Kim. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, three. There's a border that all of us share. And it keeps getting closer and closer. It's right above our heads. But it's not a border between two countries. It's actually a boundary to a place that used to be accessible to just a few of us. But now more and more of us can cross this boundary. What's been dubbed the billionaire space race. And as that happens, we humans risk messing it up. We risk sealing this border completely so no person or object can escape Earth. I wanna show you how this might happen and what we can do to avoid it. Long-term simulations show an exponential growth in the number of objects in space. This is low Earth orbit. It's a zone about a thousand kilometers above Earth. This is a place where Earth's gravity can kind of pull you down, but just enough to put you into a perpetual free fall that we call an orbit. Satellites we send into space can orbit Earth as far out as tens of thousands of kilometers, but it is in this low Earth orbit where the majority of Earth's satellites reside. The satellites here give us images like these, from telescopes like this. They also allow us to anticipate hurricanes and observe trends like these. These satellites gave us the satellite phone. Who has the satellite phone? They connect people to the internet and they help us map the world, which is something I am very grateful for. The satellites in low Earth orbit are incredibly important. Okay, so how many satellites are up there? Like 50, maybe 100? Let's see. How many? I'm Googling on my phone. Let's check. 6,000? 6,000? Whoa. Okay. So there's 6,000 satellites <laughs> floating around the Earth. Turns out that half of those are dead. They used to be satellites. Now they're just hunks of metal the size of a small school bus spinning around our planet. Of the 3,000 or so working satellites, some are military, some are government, but more than half of them are commercial. Sorry, did, did that land? Let me just say it again. Half of these satellites are commercial. They're from private companies. I was once a child with a dream. Let me explain why that's a big deal. For most of the time that we've been traveling to space, space has been a government thing. It was Russia that put up the first satellite into low Earth orbit in the 50s. It was the Cold War, so the US was like, we can do that too, and we're gonna do it better. So they created NASA and focused on getting as many satellites as they could up into space. We need science. This is for the American people, the most critical problem of all. A bunch of these launches just sort of blew up because they were really terribly made, but eventually they got satellites into space. They had something to prove. Space was a political thing at the time. President Eisenhower reassures the nation that Russia's success with the first satellite does not indicate a serious lag in American rocket research. And the U.S. poured tons of money into making this happen. And they did. Our satellite is definitely on orbit. So at this point, space was a government thing. But boy, has that changed. In recent years, there's been an explosion of satellites being put into space that are not from the government or military, but from private businesses. To the point where today, in 2021, there are over 100 private companies that are building vehicles to take more stuff into space. This is a space economy. It's a big deal. And because of that, more and more stuff is going into space. This year, 2021, we've already launched 1,100 objects into space. That's the same total as we did in all of 2020, and nearly 10% of what we've ever sent up into space. The numbers are going up faster and faster and faster every single year. But there's a problem, potentially a huge problem, with all of this stuff going up into space. And that problem is that space, at least low Earth orbit, this area right around our Earth, is limited. Let me explain what I mean here. You have all of these objects floating around our Earth, more and more every year. So what happens if two of these satellites, by chance, collide? So what? Satellites collide and maybe some rich company loses some money. Who cares? No. 
No, 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 no. Reminder that these objects are flying around Earth at 28,000 kilometers an hour. That's eight kilometers a second. In one second, eight kilometers. They go around Earth 12 times per day. And at that speed, things get a little bit crazy. A few years ago, a fleck of debris, like a little piece of dust that was one millimeter in diameter, like the tip of a sharp pencil, a tiny fleck was floating through low Earth orbit at this speed, and it hit a satellite's solar panels. And this tiny fleck of dust left a giant gash in the panels. It was one millimeter in diameter. In 2009, a collision between a defunct Russian spacecraft and an operational commercial satellite created this exact kind of shrapnel cloud, completely disintegrated. More than 2,300 hunks of space junk that are now floating around our planet at 28,000 kilometers an hour. This shrapnel at one point put the Hubble telescope at risk, and it sort of freaked people out. In an instant, two objects turn into thousands of objects, all with new paths floating around our Earth. So the fear here is that, what if this became a chain reaction? One collision makes more debris, which leads to another collision, which means even more debris and more collisions, and suddenly low Earth orbit becomes a minefield of space junk hurling around our planet at deathly speeds and launches a domino effect that would wipe out our space infrastructure, leaving us trapped on the surface of Earth for generations beneath a violent cloud of speeding shrapnel, unable to send anything up to space for a very long time. This is the nightmare scenario. It's a scenario that is portrayed in the movie Gravity, which is a very good movie. Quick pause to thank today's sponsor, Policy Genius. Policy Genius is a place where you can compare quotes for life insurance. Life insurance is one of those things that you sort of don't think about very often. You don't want to think about it because it's sort of associated with like big what ifs, but it's one of these things that is wise to have. And especially while you're young, you can lock in a really low rate on life insurance. I actually just went through this whole process. I signed up using Policy Genius and was able to compare quotes from a bunch of different life insurers. I did this all very quickly and then got on the phone with an expert at Policy Genius and soon I had a life insurance policy. So now I am insured, I have life insurance and it feels actually really good. You can save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. And you can get covered in as little as a week. For me, it was super quick. I didn't have to go do a health exam or anything. I was just able to do all the health stuff over the phone and I got covered. It was like 15 or 20 minutes of my time. Policy Genius never sells your information or anything like that, which I am a big fan of. They're just simple and they save you money. So head to policygenius.com slash Johnny Harris, go into that link, which is also in my description, help support this channel, but it also gets you started today on saving money with life insurance. All right. Let's get back to space borders. Eventually, of course, over the years, this debris would slowly fall into the atmosphere, it would lose altitude, and it would burn up in our atmosphere. But that would be generations of a world without satellites, a world that is sealed from space. Okay, okay, listen, listen. This is not gonna happen anytime soon. By all counts, we are safe from the chain reaction. The probabilities are very low. It isn't likely right now. There's a lot of space up there. Space the final frontier. But we are sending up thousands of satellites per year now. This may not be an issue now, it certainly will be soon. So what do you do with this? We're in the midst of this new space race, just like the one between the Soviets and the US in the 50s. But this time, it's not governments. It's like this guy and a bunch of guys just like him. And they're the ones who are racing to space. And they don't really care about the potential scenario of a chain reaction. Do you know why? Because they have investors to please and a world to show that they can privatize space the fastest. <laughs> so let's talk about the US government really quick. Of the 3,000 working satellites, about 2,000 of them are American. They come from American companies or the American government. So you would expect the American space government agency, NASA, to be the responsible steward of low Earth orbit and make sure that these private space companies are at least following some traffic rules when they send them up into space so that they don't collide. Alas, no one, including NASA, wants to be the one to slow down the new space race. 
Instead, they are focusing on, quote, accelerating a thriving commercial economy in low Earth orbit. The US government is sort of doing what it did in the 50s. We gotta get an edge on this new space thing and let's focus on just getting as much stuff up as we can. So NASA is helping to fund these private space companies who are sending up so many satellites and objects into space. Like SpaceX, Elon Musk's company, is sending up 60 satellites a month. <laughs> just like 60 satellites just being like thrust into space every month. And he's asked for a lot more. He wants to get 42,000 up there. Like that's what, that's what he's asking for. That's what he's asking for approval for 42,000, just 42,000. So far he's gotten approval for 12,000. Amazon is now getting into the space game. They've been approved to send up over 3,000. We're not slowing down. So clearly the race is on and no one's thinking too hard about traffic. You're blaming me for the traffic? Should I? So how do we avoid filling up low Earth orbit and avoid the collisions that could potentially cause a devastating chain reaction? These companies are taking some protocol, like SpaceX will send up these satellites in like a caravan, like a line of satellites, which looks really trippy by the way. I was out stargazing for my Galaxy video last year and I looked up and I saw this like perfect line of blinking dots in the sky and I was like, what is happening? I was sure that I was seeing like a UFO, like this is, this is it, like I'm, I have witnessed, I've had my encounter with extraterrestrials. I, 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 it was like an existential moment for me, I was like, what is happening? 20 minutes later, I looked it up and learned about the caravans that SpaceX does. They do this so that all of the satellites are in the same path so that they have way less likelihood of colliding because they're not just on random paths, they're like all together. So yeah, these private companies are taking some precautions, but as we all know, you can't rely on private companies to regulate themselves for the good of everyone. Like, are we really gonna be like, you guys regulate yourself and we'll all be safe and everyone will be good. No, that's just, that's just that's not how it works. What we need is mutually agreed upon laws on how stuff can be launched into low earth orbit so that we actually have some traffic management in space. There are no rules of the road in space. No formal agreements on how traffic should behave in low earth orbit. In other words, this is the Wild West. <laughs> Wait, isn't there like space law, like treaties, like the Outer Space Treaty, the Moon Treaty, the International Space Station? Yeah, but none of these things talk about traffic. All these countries have signed these treaties that just say that space is for everybody. No one can conquer space. No Star Wars. That isn't very reassuring. Closest any treaty gets to addressing the space traffic thing says that, quote, states shall be liable for damage caused by their space objects. In other words, if you send an object up and your country damages an object from another country, your country has to take responsibility in some form. But wait, does that actually happen? Remember that defunct Russian spacecraft that collided with the commercial satellite in 2009? Who took responsibility? And wait, was it the Russian satellite that hit the commercial one? Or was it the commercial one that hit the Russian one? Like how do you dole out responsibility and blame when you're talking about two satellites just floating through space who happen to run into each other? So in the end, the responsibility landed squarely on the shoulders of Nobody. How did we get into this mess? Decision makers couldn't even agree on who was responsible for launching the commercial satellite in the first place because multiple countries were involved with launching it and they hadn't registered it with the UN like they promised they would back in some treaty in 1972. I mean, it's a total mess. There is no order or regulation or clarity in space law, which right now is fine, but soon it won't be. So here we are with no traffic rules, no history of holding anyone accountable for unintentional space collisions, and we're about to send up tens of thousands more satellites. What we need is productive cooperation, like humans have been able to do in so many aspects of our global international system. The International Space Station is a great example. It has functioned as a multinational collaborative project in space. Unfortunately, what I've learned is that when there's competition among countries, a lot of these cooperative efforts sort of go out the window. There's growing tension between two superpowers, China and the US. 
And China is in the middle of constructing their own space station for low Earth orbit. India is preparing to send their own as well. This is competition, not cooperation. Our existing space law, which was all sort of drafted in the 60s and 70s, never anticipated private companies sending up thousands of satellites. And it didn't anticipate China and India and the US competing for space power. Our desire to explore space is not just about showing how powerful and innovative we are. So much technology has come from our space exploration, from solar cells, to cochlear implants, to firefighting technology, the development of the microchip, which was majorly accelerated by NASA, and now microchips drive our entire world. The pursuit of reaching out into space has consistently driven meaningful innovation. So this is important. We should absolutely protect the future of this really wonderful thing that humans have done. We've escaped our atmosphere, we've escaped gravity, and we've learned so much in the process. So, there are a lot of objects in space, they're floating around, and there's a body of treaties and law that is way outdated. My hope is that as we send these thousands and thousands of satellites into space, we consider the implications of what happens if we get too hasty, send too much stuff up, and things start to run into each other. It's not worth the risk in my mind. If we don't look ahead, we could turn space from a border that we can all cross together and learn together as human beings into a border that is impenetrable, that's dangerous, that keeps us trapped here on this warming planet, unable to continue to explore the world of outer space.